Great, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me up here. I drove up uh, from San Diego this morning. You know, it's interesting though, when I was out in the corridor, there was a water fountain out there. And the water that comes out of the water fountains here has come a lot further than I did coming up from San Diego. So I, I know there are some people who have come further than me, but you know, the water's come quite a long ways. And why does that matter? Because that means that what happens all across the Southwest matters to you here. You are linked through water and other systems. Your economy is linked, your jobs are linked, your quality of life is linked to this whole greater region. You might, if you were a pessimistic, think you're importing climate problems to here, but you're also, that comes with the water. So this system is quite remarkable. Uh, let me just show you where it comes from, remind you, or if you don't know, it's kind of interesting, I think. About 35% comes from the eastern Sierra Nevada of the water you get here. And this is from the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. About 35% from uh, Owens Valley region there. About, uh, about a third of the water you get here comes from the Colorado River. So next time you're at the Grand Canyon and you see that little tiny ribbon of blue down at the bottom, a third of your water is down there at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. That, that's where part of it comes from. And then about 20% comes from Northern California through a very extensive, which is code for expensive, system of water infrastructure, which has all sorts of ecological implications. Um, and if you read the newspapers, you probably know that people in Northern California aren't necessarily all that happy to bring it to Southern California. So there's all these political implications of the water too. And that leaves about 12% for local sources. Uh, for example, some comes from groundwater, and we get a little precipitation here. Now, it depends on where you are. This is for the city, really. Uh, some of the interior regions have more groundwater usage and so on. varies by year. But this, I hope, gives you a feeling for how connected you are to the whole Southwest region, which is one of the motivations, I think, for doing a Southwest assessment town hall here. You're connected to it. Okay, well, let's talk about some of these water sources and how climate change is likely to affect them. So Colorado River first, that's about a third of the supply. Um, you know, I think it's really interesting to look back and see what history has to say about this too. So what this graph shows, going back to 800, so uh, people such as Tom could do amazing work with tree rings, saying what was the water supply hundreds of years ago. And this is plotted in the way they like to plot it, so don't blame me for it, but wetter is at the bottom and droughts at the top. Okay, so when that graph goes up, it's drier. And what you see is it was a heck of a lot drier at times in the past. This is fairly well known. Now what's particularly diabolical is if you look at the end, we've been in a very wet period in the 20th century. And what happened in the 20th century? That's when we built all the water infrastructure. That's when all these people moved out here. That's when we set our expectations for what the water supply would be like during this incredibly wet period. So that's a bummer. That's really bad, <laughs> bad timing because it sets in this, this inaccurate impression of what the natural processes tend to be like. Matter of fact, it's really hideous. If you were to look at the almost the exact wettest spot, that's about when they partitioned out the water supply. So it was really, really bad timing. Okay, well, what's climate change likely to do to this water supply? It will probably reduce it around 10%. As Phil told you, different models have different estimates. This is sort of a central kind of number. Now, 10%, you might think, well, you know, it's not enormous. Maybe we can deal with that. Um, you have to keep in mind that this is against a backdrop of a really expanding population. Plus, other states, uh, other states matter too, sorry. Um, other states have legal rights to this water that they haven't exercised yet. So we're pretty much at the point where all the water that's there is being used. And yet, at the same time, more states have legal rights to it than are being used. So we're really in a bad spot with this, and climate change is just one of these factors that's going to make it more problematic. All right, well, what about changes in precipitation in California? Um, in the top left there shows the change in yearly precipitation. Um, if you look at Northern California, where we get a lot of the water, 20% or so, pretty much not much change which is a good thing. Southern California directly, maybe you know, five to 10% diminution in local precipitation. You don't get a lot of precipitation here anyway, so that probably won't matter too much. But you know, what's interesting is it's going to change by season. So for example, the yearly change is near zero in Northern California, but if you look at the winter, which that's top center thing, that shows we'll probably get about 10% more in winter. 
precipitation. Now, why? Well, in some ways, that's good. I mean, don't get me wrong. But the problem is that that's going to fall more as rain instead of snow as temperatures heat up. And we use the snowpack as a natural reservoir so we don't have to build another reservoir. We use the snowpack for this purpose. So what this means is that reservoir is progressively going away, this natural reservoir that we count on. That's a real impact of climate change you're really going to feel. All right, now in spring, you know it's been a very, very dry spring this year. We'll probably get about uh, 10 to 20 percent diminution in precipitation. And so, you know, you can't say that this particular incredibly dry spring we're having right now is directly due to climate change, but it's certainly indicative of the kind of changes we expect to see. Now, this change in the snowpack is so important. I just want to mention it in a little more detail. So the historical, this left panel shows the historical amount of water that's stored in the snow. And you can see there's a lot in the, in the mountains. As you know, we love skiing on it, blah, blah, blah. But you know, it provides a lot of water for us. Now, the center is one estimate of how that snowpack might diminish if we emit less amounts of greenhouse gas. Uh, one of the things Phil said is, you know, we not being able to predict what humans will do, uh, tend to look at a spread of probable things that humans might do. So if we get our act together, if you'll excuse the phrase, and start reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, we might have, say, half our snowpack remaining by the end of the century. Now, again, it's not that all the water disappears, because the net annual precipitation probably not much change. But the reservoir goes down because it's melting. Okay? And if we have the more emissions, and you might know that uh, currently we're on a track to exceed the most pessimistic estimates of greenhouse gas emissions, then we might have only, say, 35% of the snowpack remaining by the end of the century. So that's pretty, pretty dramatic change. Now, this is an example of how that might impact agriculture because California is a huge agricultural state. We get a lot of our economy from that. It's one of the biggest producers in the entire world. Huge industry here. So for example, um, the top shows for two particularly um, important areas for agriculture, San Joaquin Valley and Sacramento Valley, how wet years might evolve in the future. And you see a diminution as you go farther in the future, less frequency of having these wet years. And the bottom shows how often you get critically dry years. So again, you see this increase in critically dry years. And that's happening partly because you're losing that, you know, the snowpack's gone, so it, that water has run out to the ocean if we don't do something. It's lost the system. Plus, warmer temperatures means more evaporation. So let me try to summarize and sort of bring this into one coherent picture because we've got these different sources of water and how they affect us. OK, precipitation changes. Probably little annual change in Northern California, which is maybe 55% uh, of Los Angeles supply. But the timing of that's going to change, and that affects things because that snow is a natural reservoir. So we'll probably get more precipitation in winter, but less of it is snow. So if you used to have a lot of snowstorms and now you get a lot of rainstorms, that leads to a real chance of increasing in flooding. So if you live in Sacramento, say, you might really be concerned about these increases in flooding chance. Um, and then this reservoir capacity, of course, this issue. We'll probably have moderate drying, say 10% in the Colorado River Basin. Not a huge amount, but nonetheless, that's already more than spoken for. So there is these real legal and allocation issues concerned with what, it, what happens when you do get a diminution of the water supply. When I first got in this field, I kind of naively thought maybe everyone would take a 10% hit. Oh, no, totally wrong. Because people have different legal rights to it. And the ones who have the least legal rights get totally cut off before the people with senior legal rights get affected. So it really matters to you. But, and plus on top of that, the 20th century was about the wettest century in 800 years, so we got the bad expectations uh, just by chance, unfortunately. We'll probably have mudded drying up to maybe 10% in Southern California where we live here. Not a huge source of the water supply, but much of the water that is used um, in places like Southern California is for outdoor um, plants, you know, and uh, landscaping. So that actually could make a difference there. You might see changes in landscaping. And higher temperatures, on top of all this, drive more evaporation. So even, you know, we'll have these diminutions in our water supply, but at the same time, the higher temperatures means that that warmer air, as Tom uh, mentioned, is trying to suck air out of your plants more aggressively. So that leads to an increase in hydrological, hydrological drought, you know, the effect of temperatures and water on the plants themselves. Um, so that's all I have, but thank you very much.